Hello, I'd like to welcome you all to the webinar on Effective Presentations, How to Give a Farmer-Friendly Talk by Seth Wilner of the University of New Hampshire. This is the first eOrganic webinar of the fall season and also the first webinar in our Excellence in Organic Extension webinar series. You can register for all our upcoming webinars, view our many archived webinars, and find all our publications on organic farming and research at extension.org slash organic underscore production. We're very excited to have Seth Wilner as our speaker today. Seth is a farm management field specialist with the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension. He also coordinates the, SARE, the state SARE program, which for the past three years has focused on effective education methods for farmers. Also online with us today is Julie Grossman of North Carolina State University, who organized this webinar series. And she is just going to briefly introduce the series. And then without any further ado, we'll be handing the presentation over to Seth. Julie? Great. Thanks, Alice, and welcome, everybody. Um, I'd like to also welcome you to the first of the, our webinar series, the first of four, emphasizing extension training that's specific to organic production. Uh, this series was funded by a USDA NEPA Organic Transitions Grant and was really born out of a need to, to share information about how best to carry out extension practices specific to organic extension. And I think the number of participants we have here today is a real testament to that need. I hope to see all of you in the future calls as well, and, and you can register online, as Alice pointed out, so you can participate in the next three, focusing on different aspects of extension education specific to organic production. With that, again, I welcome everybody to the call, and I'll let Seth take the floor. Hello, everybody. Welcome here. I don't pretend to have um, a PhD in education theory. Um, I really w developed an interest the last five years um, when, I, when I saw participants really struggling to uh, keep their attention in presentations that had great content, um, uh, great, great, great content information, and yet the, the participants were struggling to stay awake, to pay attention, to be engaged, and it was in all different types of settings. It was in workshops, it was in small groups, it was at um, twilight meetings, um, and, it, and it didn't really seem to matter who the speaker was. So um, then in a Northeast SARE uh, um, training, we learned from Dr. Sandy Bell about adult education and her work with how farmers best learn. And so things started clicking, oh, okay, there's a, a great deal of information out there that we, we need to know as, uh, as extension educators. That made sense that, that most extension educators don't really know this because many people were, uh, you know, had a subject matter specialty areas that were fairly narrow and didn't really delve into uh, adult education. So the more I learned, the more, it's, the more it made sense. So today I'm going to try in one hour to give you, you know, what amounts to a year and a half worth of um, education that I've learned. And I just want to th thank Northeast SARE for funding a great deal of my learning and for our organization for um, supporting it. UNH Cooperative Extension really encouraged this project. Um, and we have about 18 people in New Hampshire that's gone through this training. And we're very much better uh, educators for that. So jumping right in effective presentations and how to develop and deliver real farmer-friendly talks, workshops, and, and the like. Um, so starting right off the bat with defining effective, I'm really considering effective as not just increasing farmers' knowledge, but really uh, having the farmers be able to, or any audience member, be able to use that to solve problems, to um, change behaviors. So we're really looking at the the action and behavior part, uh, behavior change, if you're thinking of a logic model, but just most effectively, how do you really take information and use it? How do you teach? So that's the case. And that's how I'm defining effective for this talk. I understand that we have a various different audiences. Um, some are grad students that might not have given uh, presentations to farmers and might be more in a, a lecture-based mode of academia. Some might be veteran extension educators. Some are farmers themselves, so on and so forth. So couch this in your world. But if you could take uh, about 30 seconds to uh, write down, thinking back to some of the best presentations you've either given or you've been to, what made them effective? And so I'm going to give you a little bit of silence for about 30 seconds, and then we'll come back and have a little discussion on that.
unmuted. All right. Uh, I don't know if anybody's willing to uh, write some of their responses in the chat box, and Alice can read those, and we might be able to learn from uh, folks what made some of the best presentations they've attended or given effective. Well, um, the comments are coming in. Um, they're flying in here, so I'm just going to read a few of them. Um, one person said humor. Another person said outdoor demonstrations um, or live demonstrations. Um, creating opportunities for farmers to exchange information with one another. Clear, organized, and responsive. Um, you can tell me when to stop here, but there are some wonderful um, responses here. Um, an open circle format that the farmer felt close to the presenter and could ask when the questions arose. Um, let's see. Anyone who links their findings to the farmer's bottom line has their attention. Um, at a legume nitrogen fixation presentation I gave in Africa, we asked farmers to each share one way they might try to integrate legumes in the coming season or get more out of the legumes they were growing. Speakers that engage the audience through icebreakers and the like and um, lead to sharing that promoted peer-to-peer -peer education. So we're seeing a lot of common yeah. themes. Um, and enthusiasm was another one. Excellent. Um, as we move forward with the talk, we'll actually see how many of these things fit right, fit very nicely in with principles of uh, effective adult education. Um, so there'll be a little bit of a uh, why behind these answers. Why does that make for effective? All right, well, let's flip the coin and say, think about some of the worst presentations you've been to um, or some of the worst ones you've conducted, unfortunately, um, and what made those ineffective. Again, I'll give you about 30 seconds and we'll write those down. Alice, do you have any to read to oh, us? Oh, yeah. We have plenty to read here. Um, some <laughs> good ones, too. Um, Text-filled PowerPoints, ivory tower speakers, um, poor English, too big of a group, not everyone could hear the speakers, um, speaking to the wrong audience, presenter simply read from the slide, complicated graphics with small legends, too much jargon, a monotone speaker, not having time to get across the concept, too technical for the audience, one person in the audience dominates the speaker, boring, information not relevant to me, monotone and presenter read information did not have eye contact, scientifically dense language, too many animations in the PowerPoint. Um, so let's see, I'm trying to find some, there's a, oh, being talked at, condescending manner, lack of thorough knowledge of the subject, um, the instructor spoke more about herself rather than about the subject. Um, too esoteric. Uh, lecture format. Biased position. Um, top down. Um, with unasked for advice. Um, a livestock enterprise budget workshop where the person sped through spread spread no I'm sorry sped through an Excel spreadsheet that he built in advance of the workshop. Can't hear the speaker. Too much information. Bad jokes. <laughs> Bad jokes. <laughs> you gotta give. You gotta forgive people on the bad jokes. <laughs> um, those two um, really fit quite nicely with uh, what makes uh, effective and ineffective talks. Um, so that's that's excellent. We're going to get into the whys later on, and this sets us up pretty nicely. Um, note that that in this format, I'm trying to really demonstrate some of the um, better better uh, adult education te techniques. Um, Webinars, I don't think, really fall into that all that readily. But even starting out now, um, here we have we're learning from each other. It's not just one person speaking, um, and so those are those are things that have been mentioned um, that do make for effectiveness and things to keep in mind when you make your talks up, giving the aud giving the participants a voice and being able to learn from each other. So 
one key point. Um, there's not one way to give an effective talk. There's some principles um, that you can employ. You're going to have your own style, um, and that's going to count for a lot. Um, and you're also your prior experiences are also going to be pretty key. You can't be somebody that you're not when when talking. I know a lot of folks that uh, give talks that uh, you know humor is just not some, something they're going to break out. Certainly, enthusiasm can be though, but just to you know really refine that. Find your method, find your style. Okay, how do adults learn? Um, you will find this, uh, the next several slides here, really just to capture a few quotes that really bring up the, the major point. They learn through experience. Um, that, that's pretty key. Uh, I think the, the next slide. Uh, you can't give ideas to adult learners like birthday presents. Um, and the brain doesn't take meaning, it, it must make meaning. Pretty, pretty clear there that if, if we're going to have a content-filled PowerPoint text-based lecture and we're going to say, Here, here's what this means, open your mind, open your um, head up and we're going to pour it in, that, that just does not work. And yet with frequency, that's often what we get. And so we can give content and we'll, as we see as we go forward, but we we're going to have to help the learners make meaning from that content and process that. Um, and so our job really is going to be to facilitate learner experiences, give them the content they need, Muted. Ex um, exercises or experiences or some way of taking that um, material so that it can make it into their, into their long-term memory. All right. Okay. So what we're going to get into um, next is really going to be how the brain learns. I think this is pretty cool stuff. Some people might find it boring, but this was really the gap in understanding the, the, the science behind how the brain learns and takes information. Um, and so um, some of the neat points that we'll come to see, the brain actually forms physical patterns, um, neurological patterns um, from, from past experiences and past information. And you have to change these patterns for new learning to happen. And only through new experiences will these physiological patterns in the brain change um, and then you'll be able to absorb new information. Some of the um, two key people really have helped shape my thinking, actually three. One's Chuck Bagley, another is Dr. Sandy Bell, and then another is uh, uh, my wife, Dr. Ann Spencer. And then a fourth person, actually Janet McAllister, has also been really instrumental in various conversations. So what follows are, is Chuck Bagley's work. He is at a Granite State College in New Hampshire, and you can look him up on the web if you want. So Chuck points out this, uh, he kind of created this uh, learning continuum. Uh, and so on the, all the way to the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see your five senses. That's followed by your brain. And so what happens is that your, your brain is bombarded with all the sensory information from all of your senses. And interestingly enough, 90 to 95% of that information actually just doesn't make it through. It just gets rejected. Um, and there's this little, he uses the uh, symbol of a customs agent. Uh, and that customs agent really is kind of ride and herd as to what makes it into your brain and what doesn't. So very exciting things make it into your brain. Um, but also some you know, fairly primal things uh, make it into the brain. The brain is looking, uh, the environment scanning for food, things, threats to survival, and opportunities to mate. And I don't think that that's really limited by age. It's just what the brain looks like. Um, and so um, once, once, you, once it does make it through this uh, short-term memory, then it gets into the working memory. What's interesting though is in the working memory, you actually have to process that information in some meaningful way to have it then go into the long-term memory and be available for a recall. So, okay, we're saying, okay, so what does that all mean? What it really means is that if you want it into your long-term memory so that you actually, as a learner, can recall it and use it to solve problems, to change practices on your farms or have farmers change practices on their farms, it, it's going to, one, have to get in, through the customs agent and the short-term memory, be processed and then be practiced once it's in the long-term uh, memory, which is pretty key. 
Um, what it's certainly suggested in all the reading I've read is that a, a PowerPoint in a monotone uh, presentation is never going to make it through the short-term uh, customs agent memory. Um, and that was some of the things that we heard folks saying as they were saying what was ineffective. So to make an effective talk, really looking at some way to um, have the, the brain process. And that's just showing it to you again. So there is yet another key point. Facilitate experiences to achieve true long-term learning. Easier said than done depending on your educational form, right? Um, today we're really using writing and journaling as a, as a process or as that blender image in your mind um, so that you can kind of link things to your past experiences as we'll discuss and also kind of process it. If you have an audience filled with 70 people and you are one of seven one-hour talks, you're going to have to think of some more creative ways um, and we can talk about that as we go on. All right. Unmuted. The idea that we have to facilitate. So again, take 30 seconds and, and uh, describe some of the times when you facilitated some successful facilitations instead of just telling information and share those with us. Back to you, Alice. Do we have any? Oh, uh... yes, we do. Um, we, um, let's see, they're coming in fast here, so I have to backtrack Fast here. and furious. Um, okay. Um, oh, there are quite a few. Okay, one of them, I remember the first one was to um, involve a variety of experts in, um, in the learning and having um, different presenters. So hang on one second here. Okay. Okay. Draw out pictorial meanings of a message. Um, have breakout groups for peer-to-peer -peer understanding. Um, hold some hands-on group demonstrations. Have diversity trainings. Um, sometimes I have learners share in small groups how the information affects their business. Set up stations at a field day or in a classroom and have the participants go through them. Soybean weed control demonstrations. Soybeans planted at different seeding rates showed how effective this could be as a weed control measure. Um, passing around physical samples. Facilitated farmers sharing challenges in small groups with other group members offering feedback and ideas. Um, Hands-on training sessions, um, such as a workshop on record keeping. Um, practice the presentation with a variety of audience, including kids, to get feedback. Um, showing people a particular site up close and personal. Um, writing articles about my research in basic language that anyone can understand. Ask the audience the question before you just provide the answer and allow them the opportunity to provide their experiences and a better discussion comes. Um, I was able to offer a series of open-ended questions on a topic that allowed participants to explore the topic, um, do demonstrations, hands-on exercises, um, branding workshop wherein participants chose a commonly known product and described and or drew its brand personality. Um, did a dance showing where in plant where plant nutrients are going. Um, and uh, farm tours and uh, repetition by different means. Nice. Yep. So some of some of those um, examples, uh, I was struck by two things. One, sometimes um, what we defined as uh, facilitation was still a presentation. Um, dancing uh, or presenting with visuals or presenting with words is still presenting. So the the learner is still mostly in a, a passive mode. I'm watching a dance. I'm watching um, someone marry uh, the, the text with pictures or the presentation with pictures. So the learner is still in a passive mode. And yet some, some of the examples were very um, interesting ways where the learner was in an active mode. Um, one that I wrote down was um, 
giving in information and having um, breaking into small groups and the learners discuss um, how that information would affects their business. Now they're really being forced to think and process. If you think of that that blender in that previous slide and you're hitting the on button, here they're taking that information and they're processing how could those, that affect my business. Um, asking open-ended questions um, and then having the, the learners give their answers. Again, their brain is forced to process information related to themselves or experiences past or potentially in the future. Um, and asking just questions and having the learners try and articulate uh, knowledge. Those are some more active um, answers on how you could facilitate. Demonstrations can be facilitation. Likewise, it could be just another way of presenting. So if I'm out in a field and I'm just walking along and, and the, the presenter is saying, this is soybean one, this is soybean two, this is soybean three, see the difference in color, see the difference in vigor, I'm, I'm still really kind of passive, paying attention, walking along, um, and just kind of absorbing. It's not that I'm per se interacting. Now maybe there would be a discussion that was had, maybe you give a problem, given the three uh, soybean demonstrations saying, so which one do you think received th this nutrient application? Which one do you think received uh, you know, this treatment? And that might be an active way of facilitating. But nice, nice uh, ideas there. Moving on along with how the brain works to our next slide, um, we are looking at, if my keyboard works, come on. Uh, there we go. Um, backing up one. So Dr. Uh, John Medina wrote this book called The Brain Rules. It's $12. It's easily to read uh, and, uh, and absorb. Um, and so w what he did is, is he really looked at the science, both his own research and then also, you know, collated a bunch of research in the field on how the brain actually works. And what's going to follow is, um, f I think we're going to touch on four of his 12 rules of how the brain works and their, their implication for um, teaching. So one of the first things, his rule number four, is we don't pay attention to boring things. Again, remember being bombarded with that sensory information and the brain just rejecting about 90 to 95% of it. It just doesn't make it through because we just have so much information getting it coming from us at the five senses. So one is the amount of information. Another thing is that influences what we pay attention to is our previous experience. Do we, did we find this interesting in the past? Are your brain keys in on it? Did we find it a threat? Did we find it some opportunity for survival or, or whatever have you? Culture is also going to make a difference as to what we pay attention to. Um, but we definitely pay attention to things like emotions, threats, um, and, and, uh, and mating opportunities. Can I eat it? Will it eat me? Can I mate with it? Those are some primal things that your brain tunes into. So try and work that into your talk. Um, Another major finding he had that has probably really impacted me a lot, and I would, I would write this down if I were taking notes, and it says that uh, he found that you really have a, about 10 minutes that your brain can really absorb information. Uh, I've seen different studies, but none of them exceeded 20 to 25 minutes. So here we are oftentimes lecturing for you know, upwards of 50 minutes. You know, begging our audience, you know, oh, I just have five more slides, hang in there with me. And you know that you're really almost wasting their time, you're likely wasting their time and your time. So 10 minutes is the idea that if you could really kind of chunk out your information, 10, 15, 20 minutes, and then really do something to process that information, that would be pretty key to a, an effective talk. Um, so then there's Dr. David uh, Sousa also is a brain researcher, and he found something called the uh, primacy recency effect, where the brain actually remembers what it first learned and what it last learned. So when your talk's really trying to key, um, get the key information right out of the, the gate, here's key points, you know, with, within that first chunk of time when the learner's really tuned in and the brain's absorbing information, and then likewise, re really trying to make additional new key points towards the end, so the first and the last thing the brain really retains, and then using the interim space to process and to uh, um, give experience and to facilitate. Um, and so then, next slide. 
So repeat to remember, and learning is cumulative. So the human brain can hold about seven pieces of information for less than 30 seconds. And if you want to extend that 30 seconds or a few minutes or even an hour, you'll have to consistently um, re-expose the brain to that information. And, and memories are just really, really volatile. That's why you have to repeat. Um, another way that you can, so in addition to re repeating something, another way to help the brain remember is to actually add complexity to it. Uh, one example that uh, Dr. Medina gives is you're at a party and you're trying to remember names. And so you, you, you meet someone named Mary. And they're, in, in order to remember their name, you can repeat, it's Mary, it's Mary, it's Mary. You might say, OK, Mary has a blue dress on. Blue is my favorite color. You add this complexity to try and help the, the brain remember. Um, Medina's research shows that we forget about 90% of what we learn in a class within 30 days. And we do the majority of that forgetting within a few hours after the class. So it really hinges on that first few seconds of memory into what we, we remember. And so hence, repeating. Uh, repeating often and repeating in, a, in effective ways of using that information is going to be pretty key. Um, now that's again to make it to the short-term memory. Then is rule number six. Uh, my screen is just not responding. Um, let's so, oh, there you go. So rule number six is if you want it to make it into the long-term memory, so you've repeated, it, you've processed it in some meaningful manner, we'll talk about um, shortly, and now you actually got it into long-term memory. There too, it's going to have a finite shelf life unless you start really using it, and that's the importance of practicing it. So yeah, you learned it, you got it, you got it into long-term memory, now you use it. And so if you want to retain it, and that's any skill, playing a musical instrument, learning how to do a balance sheet, whatever it's going to be. So that, that's pretty key is, uh, once it's in the long-term memory, and hence that quote by Clark Aldrich. If you had, uh, he says, if I had six hours to learn anything, I would spend four of it practicing it, and that would really entrench it into that long-term memory. All right. We had somebody um, had mentioned, or if not a few people, that in one of the worst presentations were those text-filled PowerPoints. Um, and so we are really, our brain is really wired to remember pictures. It's uh, how we evolved. And so um, if you hear a piece of information, Three days later, they um, say you'll remember about 10% of it. If you actually added a picture to that uh, uh, text information, you'll remember 65% of it um, three days later. So pictures certainly beat text. Um, vision's really uh, important to us. As a rule of thumb, you get three times better recall for visual information than from oral information, and you get six times better recall for information that is both visual and oral. So by hearing it and seeing it, that's six times better uh, recall. The last rule we'll get from uh, Medina is, whoops a daisy, we are powerful and natural explorers. So again, sometimes during the uh, um, best presentations people mentioned earlier that um, there was opportunities for farmers to experiment, to exchange, and to learn. Um, and that's going to be something that we'll see as we come up in our talk. Actually taking the content, taking the information, and experimenting with it goes back to when we were a child. So children's brains actually are a good model for how we learn. They don't learn passively, but they're actively testing. They're touching things. There, you know, you say, oh, don't put your finger in that outlet, or don't put your finger close to the uh, the burner, or whatever have you. But they want to feel, they want to play with, they want to experiment, and and so too do uh, uh, learners. So giving the opportunity to experiment in some way, shape, or form with the information is going to be pretty key. All right. So here's another writing. How would you incorporate any of what we just discussed in those brain rules? into your work as a farmer educator. And I'm going to use the next slide to kind of put them all up there so you could see them. And I'm going to give you 30 seconds again to uh, try and write down some of those things that you might incorporate.
All right, Alice, you're on. Okay, this one I think probably takes a little more time to think about, but we still have a lot of ideas coming in. Um, first one is photos, photos, photos um, in social media. Um, make lots of visuals, pictures, or comics. Um, visual aids, link information to farmer profit. Um, give workshops in a series instead of standalone. Um, incorporate the idea of play. Um, ten minute chunks. Um, practice in advance. Uh, not too much text if I use slides. Um, repeat the major concepts. Um, give the group a short assignment, um, an outline, a verbal or um, written or picture of their choice, a standard operating procedure for um, for a farm that incorporates the new concept. I couldn't quite get the whole thing, but um, most of it there to give a short assignment. Um, add colorful and high quality pictures, introducing something they can relate to. Um, more photos if the workshop can't take place outdoors. Um, field demonstrations, I would have them help with plantings and recording information and have a blog for them to ask questions. Um, talk 10 minutes and then do something for 10 minutes. Have an organized agenda to show the points for the talk and remember to start and close with it. Um, I'd use the first five minutes to tell what the presentation is about and the last to conclude. Um, making presentations participative. Um, provide opportunities for hands-on exploring. Um, lots of comments about good pictures and hands-on activities and less mm -hmm. time for presenting. Um, yep. Hearing from other farmers and having students draw diagrams so they can get a visual and are active. And by the way, we did have a request um, whether other people's ideas are going to be uh, made available to everybody. And um, I can, um, what I can do is I can post the answers to the questions, um, removing everybody's names um, on the website um, in a day or two um, after this presentation um, because there are several people that were interested in that. So, you know, it'll have all the names removed, but it'll have all the ideas and I'll organize it um, by question so you can see um, people's responses because we're certainly getting a lot of good ideas. There were a lot of good ideas and that's somewhat of the beauty of this information. Y you get this, this new information of how the brain learns and how um, learners best learn and people's ideas and experiences and you can really do some really powerful and, and potent adjustments to your talks and make them more effective. I, I liked, I resonated with the, the, the pictures and comments that again worked because you get six-fold um, increased retention if you have both words and, and visuals. I like the idea of the series and not stand alone. I think that that's pretty key. It gives the opportunity to repeat, it allows people to ask questions on previous sessions, and it, as we'll see as we go forward, it keeps building on knowledge. Um, and so that learning is cumulative. You remember that slide with the uh, um, hay bales, uh, the round bales stacked on top of each other. Absolutely that works. And then the 10 minute chunks and repeating. Short assignments are also pretty key and we'll see that as we come up. Learning from each other's and, and hands-on exploration also help that drive, drive that home. So neat, neat feedback. All right. Th this uh, seems so simple. Uh, you know, think of how the brain learns and not just provide content. Uh, with that said, I had been teaching for 13 years and I just would go and I'd give content. I'd try and be humorous. I'd try and have some interactive, but by and large, it was content and it was content for one hour to three hours, sometimes six hours. God bless you, but it, so it was it was content. So uh, now we're really trying to take that into account and, and break that up in ways people just uh, spoke about. We're going to shift gears now um, to Dr. Sandy Bell's work. Uh, she's a professor at uh, University of Connecticut. Uh, she did a project, I, I bet it was eight years ago, maybe a decade ago, studying how farmers learn. Um, and so you can read about that in the Journal of Extension if you wanted. Um, you'll see on your screen uh, a, s a picture for sustainable agriculture through sustainable learning. At the end of our presentation, there will be a, a link to a website, um, and it's the uh, our New Hampshire SARE website, and all the um, references um, and, and resources that we've mentioned today are up there, including this guide that you can download. And this is a real nice guide. I think putting words to what we've discussed today will also be uh, helpful for you. And that, of course, was funded by Northeast Sarah. I'll give them their props. 
All right, so putting the five practices together. This, this is fun stuff. All right, so dig on this. Five practices. Whoops, a daisy. We're going to go through each of these together. You can see really how they all build on each other. They interact with each other. Um, so we'll take them one by one. Create a safe learning environment. Whoops, sorry about that. So creating a safe learning environment is going to be pretty key. Right now, I, I, would, um, I didn't really want to uh, beat this one to death. Uh, I would ask folks how they created safe learning environments and uh, that, that idea of this open-ended question, we'd all learn from each other and our brains would process together. For the sake of time, we won't have um, the ability to do that, but there's, there's two things that, that I'll invite you to think about. One is that physically safe learning environment and the other is kind of that emotional safe learning environment. So physically safe, comfortable seating, good light, temperature, you know, not too hot, not too cold, and we've all been in rooms that, have, you, you know, we've lost 30 pounds worth of sweat or we've, you know, had frostbite on our fingers and toes. So really having that physical setting, the setup to some, sometimes chairs in a circle, whatever have, have you that your purpose is in setting the room up for, but just tune into a nice physical safe learning environment. Um, and then that emotional safe learning environment, in some of the worst presentations, uh, uh, when we just, you had given your feedback earlier, people had, had mentioned, you know, one person dominates a talk, or other, or they bully a talk, or minority views are not um, allowed to be expressed, um, or uh, if people don't have the confidence really to share what they think. So really trying to make sure that as a facilitator, you're really creating an, uh, an environment where people can give their opinions, where they can feel free to learn, where they can think outside the box. Um, some of the ways to do that, certainly ground rules help, certainly you as a facilitator, um, really pulling out, okay, let's hear from someone that, that we've not heard from yet. Or if someone's going on and on saying, okay, I think that I understand your point, maybe repeat it for them and then move on to another uh, person speaking. Um, Likewise, building community, which is another, uh, which isn't something else that someone added in, in a, an effective talk, helping the participants feel comfortable with each other by getting to know each other. Sometimes if you're really time, uh, short of time and you know who's um, coming, you could do this ahead of time via email, via Skype, or you know, some, some electronic way of trying to build that community. Also, helping people to stay on topic creates a, an um, uh, emotionally safe environment. So. Those are some of the ways. I bet that folks would have a, a lot of other ways, um, and maybe at, in the next, when, when this ends at 3 o'clock in that live chat, we can discuss that. So here's another 30-second time to write. How do you think emotion impacts people's learning? Alice, you have anything for us? We do. Um, we definitely have people um, feeling that emotion does have an effect on learning and sometimes quite a large effect on learning. Um, it's critical to learning. Um, the fear of a topic, um, such as math, causes people to shut down. Um, it can prevent people from being open-minded. Um, emotion triggers memory, but it's also distracting. Um, Enthusiasm for a topic can help people to be open to learning more. Emotion makes them open to learning or unwilling to try to learn. Um, I don't learn when I'm upset or intimidated. Um, if they feel attacked, um, I think they resist or reject information. Um, emotion can enhance if excited or can detract if put off. If they feel comfortable, they're going to be willing to share their ideas. Um, I know that when I'm stressed or anxious, my ability to focus, concentrate is significantly impacted. Mm -hmm. um, how a person feels about the information and speaker can affect his or her willingness to be receptive to what's being shared. 
Um, huge impact, how safe people feel to learn, how comfortable they are to share and ask questions, how collegial they are to others in the audience. Um, when people feel defensive, they stop listening to others. Um, they're part of being human, and the chemicals in the body that affect the brain can be a rush of reactions. Um, if they feel respected or welcome, they tend to be more open to new information. Um, stops, it closes yeah. the door if they're not comfortable. Um, negative emotions like fear or anger can inhibit learning. And um, last one, engaging emotion can make people care about what's being presented. Yeah, we'll see in the coming slides that people pretty much nailed that. Um, one of the things that we didn't discuss in Medina's research was stress, and stress absolutely will shut the brain down. Um, so it, it's an interesting thing how even our systems are set up, college and, and uh, high schools and whatnot. We give these high stress exam periods and we assess learning when we know that the brain shuts down on that. But I guess you can't change everything all that quickly. So, we got one more comment. Um, I just wanted to say, and this is an interesting one, that language barriers can also um, contribute to emotional responses. It, it does. L language barriers absolutely can contribute to uh, emotional responses. Hence, um, some of the worst presentations uh, a person mentioned, or some people mentioned jargon. We can sometimes create our own language barriers, um, words that we're familiar with, uh, academics or our research. Do us no, do us a disservice when we try and transmit that to uh, learners. It's an entirely different language. So absolutely. Um, so here you can see the six core emotions. Um, somebody had mentioned fear causes people to shut down. It absolutely does, and that's going to be something. This is in this, the area of creating a safe learning environment. If you know you're going to teach something that creates phobia, math fears, science, chemistry, whatever it's going to be. Um, you'll want to take that into account because once you shut people down with your you know, derivations of your equations, uh, good luck getting them back. And then of course you can see up here with your the green, the joy and the surprise, that's, that's some emotions you're looking to trigger. Dr. Bell put together this next slide where you really are actually strategically trying to trigger joy and surprise. So you, you're going to try and surprise people. Uh, it's going to help that brain pay attention. Again, that 10 minutes that you have, if you can surprise that brain into really tuning in. Um, you remember Medina's rule, it was four, I believe. We don't pay attention to boring things. Surprise your audience and, and uh, um, show something that's going to get their attention. Or joy, set them up for success. So people like to succeed, of course, right? So you give a problem set or you ask answers and people get the right answers. That's a positive uh, emotion. Obviously, we spoke about fear and anger. Anger and frustration are very closely related. They don't get what you're saying. The language is a, a barrier. You're going to frustrate people, and they're going to turn off. So those are some of the ideas there. Um, final thing, because we can't say it enough, try your darndest not to trigger fear. Um, it actually causes chemical reactions in the brain, to sh and the brain shuts down. So those are the key points that really try and, and, and uh, strategically plan for um, eliciting emotion. It's not something to be afraid of. It's something actually to plan for. Try and um, work joy in. Try and work surprise in. If you're, you know, I, I teach farm management. Um, anytime we're getting into number crunching, just absolutely being aware that likely it is going to trigger fear or phobias in people. So how do I get around that? How can I teach those concepts with games, with uh, different props, with uh, by putting people together in groups that are well versed in certain aspects and others that are um, less skilled in it and trying to create a teamwork and teacher to teacher, farmers teaching other farmers, those type of things might uh, actually uh, be ways that you can plan for an emotional response that can help lead you towards success. All right. So now we're going to switch gears into another principle. And prior to getting into this, I'm going to ask you to write. Uh, this might be your last writing one. Um, what do you think? What assumptions did you have about participating in this webinar in the days leading up to it? And I will give you 30 seconds.
What do you have for us, Alice? Okay. Um, well, um, one person said it was my first webinar, so I thought it might be boring. Um, mm -hmm. And um, one person said, I wasn't sure if the time spent would reap a payoff. Um, one person wanted to learn how to design individual slides. Uh, not many, truthfully. I try to keep an open mind. Um, I thought I would be a fish out of water since I don't teach ag but lead ag agents. This has been a pleasant surprise. Um, straight PowerPoint, no discussion, but it wasn't. I expected a lot of conversation about adult learning, um, that you'd share some best practices, um, we'll learn good content, um, that it would be um, addressed to farmers. I can't wait to read Dr. Bell's paper. I assumed I probably already knew the content in another form, erroneously. I hope that the information would be relevant and useful to me as an ag educator. Looking forward to learning more as I will be sharing Dr. Bell's research with my colleagues next month. Um, didn't know that you were going to mention her work. I thought it would be a static, non-participatory format, as is usually the case with webinars. Um, that it would focus primarily on farmer learning, specific concepts relating to farmers. Um, in addition to presentation tips, I thought this talk might help presenters relate to farmers easier. The online interface would make it difficult to glean real information that would help me that the topics wouldn't address the tough issues of slow adopting farmers. Um, was hoping for more specific tips on working with the grower clientele, um, that it might focus too much on principles and not provide specific examples, that it would be useful for my job, excited, um, that I've learned something new. Um, All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so great, great feedback. Um, I too have um, the purpose of this was to illustrate a point that we rarely will come to an educational event. We being adults, we being farmers, will rarely come to an educational event without some preconceived notions. Um, my my notions on webinars, I, I try and avoid them like the flu. I find them boring and being talked at, and my mind shuts down fairly quickly. And I usually search the web a little bit during it. Um, and so I was like, whoa. I didn't get the chance to actually, at the beginning, kind of ferret out what your, um, what Dr. Bell calls mental models were. So I had to make some assumptions. Um, and so you too, though, when you teach adults, when you teach farmers, you're going to have to identify what their prior knowledge and personal views are about a, a subject. And if, and if you don't do that, that's going to be a huge barrier to being able to um, uh, effectively teach them. So um, I'm going to actually back up a, a touch and, and tell you a, a quick story to illustrate it. And stories are another way of um, transmitting information, but it still is a, you as a, are unfortunately in a passive listening mode, so I apologize. But um, in grad school, we certainly learned all about um, organic matter, and we certainly teach farmers organic matter is just the bomb. It's great for um, building chemical properties of the soils. It's great for um, physical properties of the soils, tilth, so on and so forth. It's great for building, you know, um, the, the flora of the soils and the, uh, the the microbiology of it. Excellent. It's it's just good stuff. Likewise, in grad school, I learned that uh, phosphorus is pretty much not all that soluble. So if you can prevent erosion, you can prevent water pollution um, in uh, fresh water systems. So, well, that stuff is somewhat changed. Uh, certainly, the chemistry of phosphorus has changed, and it's more soluble than people thought. So if you asked me who is my most revered soil scientist in the world, without question, I'd say Dr. Tom Morris from UConn. Uh, dude's just a, a gem of a guy and super smart. So I got my Cornell soil health tests back, and at a meeting a month ago, I presented them to Tom and my soils on my farm. I had five samples, and they ranged from 8 to 18% organic matter. I was like, hey, wahoo, this is fabulous. Um, and they had excessively high P, as anyone would, uh, high phosphorus, as anyone would imagine. But I wasn't too bothered by that. I don't live near any water bodies, and we don't have erosion. So Tom looks at my uh, soil samples, he's like, wow, your organic matter is way too high. And I was like, nah, that, that's good. And he's like, well, no, it's not. And he starts explaining to me why. But I'm not really uh, hearing him all that much because I'm under my previous uh, viewpoint was organic matter is good, phosphorus is insoluble. It, it's it's not a problem, and and to to my surprise, I find myself like debating and arguing with with Tom. 
here, here the guy has way more information than I do about it, uh, the subject, and you know, likewise, I have you know, ultimate respect for him. But in, in hindsight, what happened is my mental model was organic matter is great. No one's ever told me you could have too much, and phosphorus is insoluble. And despite Tom telling me the opposite, and despite my respect for him, I wasn't able to change my, my thinking on it. So he had no impact on me in the education. That's going to happen um, when we present information that contrasts against our participants, our farmers' mental models. And, and they're going to come with their own um, preconceived notions. So that next slide, again, um, we talk about experience. So mental models, which is to say your the, the physical, it's an actual physical pattern of your brain is formed from its past knowledge, past experiences. And if you're going to present new information um, that's going to, and you're asking people to form new mental models all the way to the right, you're going to have to um, uh, bear with them over time. You're going to have to first ferret out what are their existing mental models? How do they feel about things? And then use that information and build that on that information to actually bring them um, to expanding their own mental models and accepting the new information. And likewise, it's going to have to be experiential. It's not that you're going to tell them new data, they're going to absorb that. They're going to have to prove to themselves so that experimentation, that Medina rule um, where people want to experiment with things, some hands-on activity. The next slide will, will show it a little bit more. Again, oh, whoops, uh, prior to that next slide, here's one way of actually kind of ferreting out mental models. Um, you could ask people if they had a, um, what problem have you had with a certain subject? How did you go about uh, addressing it? Um, that's going to kind of give you an idea of um, what their approach is in farming. So, how, what problem have you had with uh, you know common bed straw, and how did you go about addressing it? You know, and they might say, well, we use tillage because we don't believe in chemicals, or we threw every chemical we could find at it at twice the labeled rate. You know, these things are going to show you what they think about viable solutions and of uh, that weed control. That's just one example. Um, can you tell me what led you to, you know, whatever decision it was? That's going to give you insight into their mental models. Sometimes people might, you know, really express a, some visceral uh, opinion. That too is going to give you um, some insight if you can ferret that out. And the point of this slide is also that mental models, as, as Dr. Bell points out, is tacit, meaning people don't really know that. They don't know what they're feeling. I had to think about why was I arguing with Dr. Morris? You know, I like the guy and he's like knows more about soil fertility than I do. And I had to really think, okay, my mental model is organic matter is great and more organic matter is greater. <laughs> you know? Um, and so the the idea you're gonna have to help your audience sometimes ferret out what their mental models are so they can then manage those, move beyond those if you're trying to have new concepts. Um, okay, next practice as we're coming to the close of our time. This is Dr. Bell's third best practice or principle. Many people really nailed it um, when they talked, uh, spoke about um, what their uh, most effective talks were. It's really linking any new content to prior experience. Again, really trying to get at the brain and how it has patterns and how it has patterns of the past. It's also trying to get information into that short-term working memory by linking past experience with the brain pays attention to to new experience. And so um, trying to figure out what their mental models are and what their past experience is and using that information to bring them forward. So with frequently, if your approach is, oh, that grazing practice that you've been doing, that's just garbage. Here's one that works better. That's going to be a swing and a miss. Um, in all probability. People aren't just going to reject their past experiences likely. Oh, you've been keeping records that way? Well, that's just ridiculous. This is the way you want to do it. Instead, you're going to have to um, figure out what of the past has relevance and how you build on that um, to, to have this new content be actionable. So when someone mentioned you know, a series of events instead of one, that really helps you build on past experience over time. You can see that um, as we go um, the, the first row, here's your past prior experiences, and then bingo, they really fit nicely with your new experiences. Um, you can see, let's just take this example of a Holstein cow on the left, and then we see a Holstein and a Jersey cow. 
So you might say, boy, Holstein cows, they really have a high volume of uh, milk production. But in a grazing system, you know, Jersey cows might be able to produce more components or butter fat, and that might be a more profitable way, um, way of uh, farming. You want to link Jerseys and Holsteins. You might want to say, yes, Holsteins can perform on pastures, but here's you know, some of the, the downsides of it. And Jerseys, you know, thus, might be an improved uh, breed. Again, linking the past. Um, the next example of corn and grain, and then moving to a diet that was, you know, perhaps more of a of a grass based, or corn is a grass, a, a different type of forage based. Those type of things, building on the past and linking it to the to the future or to the new knowledge, that's going to be pretty key. Without that, it's going to be hard for the brain to actually absorb that, and it's going to be unlikely that people are really going to use that new knowledge um, in a meaningful way. I'm going to kind of skip over this slide. Here, here's you know a slide that illustrates that. You know, you have build their past experiences up here with their new content. Give them new experiences to play with that content. They're going to form new brain patterns, and they're going to modify their mental models. They're going to have their current mental model, and they're going to be able to modify that into a new mental model. I'm at an extreme disadvantage to see whether you are all drooling or whether you are looking at me like I have three heads. So um, I can't really build on topics that I sense you are not understanding. So we're going to have to keep moving forward, and maybe in the in the future, in the next session, we can through the chat room clarify um, points that are not clear. Out of the five best practices that Dr. Bell put together, here is best practice four, and that's really letting learners work together to experiment with new content. Um, this is really pretty key in helping people to shape new mental models. One, you obviously have to have a safe learning environment where, again, people aren't defensive, they're open. Two, other farmers, other people that are their peers, sharing, having learning from their experiences can help shape uh, people's mental models. Um, that, so that peer-to-peer -peer learning is, is pretty, pretty important. We also discussed that the food processor part of the brain. So if you give new content, this is an, another way of actually having it, the active working um, memory process this new information by having people work together to experiment, to play, to solve problems, to talk about how it affects their own farm operations, to talk about how this might really fit in with past practices. It gives them another way of processing it so it fits into that uh, the long-term memory. Um, maybe that's p small groups creating a financial plan together or a grazing plan together. Maybe uh, people creating budgets together. Maybe it's you handing out soil tests or nutrient tests or photos of a crop um, disease and saying, okay, what do you see in this and, and how would you solve the problem? And letting them play with that in those type of very active ways. So those are uh, another way of helping learners really to uh, um, be able to absorb your information. The last practice is giving learners choice in both the content and in the process. So oftentimes it's hard to give learners a choice in content. Sometimes you can do it beforehand. Focus groups can really inform educational um, series and workshops, um, needs assessments, those type of things. During, in a lot of presentations that I give, I'll actually put an agenda up in the morning, and rarely will I ever stick with that agenda. I'll take the pulse two hours in and say, okay, so how are we doing now? You know, do we need more time on this? Do we need less time on th this other um, subject area? Um, you want to skip this altogether? Uh, clearly, you have to be well versed in your your content area to go off script, though, right? Um, and, and be able to go into something new. But giving learners choice, it gives them ownership, and when they have ownership in their learning, they're more committed to it. Then, of course, giving them choice in the process. Um, shit, you want to bypass PowerPoint altogether. You want to go into small groups. You want to stay a large group. And so that, that counts for a lot. Now, I've done this and, and gotten knocked on evaluations where they're like, you know, don't take up so much class time giving us choice. So not everyone likes it, but it, it still is uh, an effective uh, recommended best practice. And I think that if you do it enough, uh, participants will come to uh, appreciate that. But that is the fifth and last best practice by Dr. Bell. Um, 
So here's some strategies for giving them choice. Um, giving them choice of location, look, reading, um, how many in-person in sessions would you like, how many distance learning sessions might you like, um, afterwards trying to form communities so that learners can share their knowledge and experiences with a broader community um, after the event is over. So those, that's another way of giving a choice. So really um, closing up, Ben Franklin wrote this, many probably, people have probably uh, seen it, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn, and that really matches to some of those examples people gave, going and actually planting out with, with uh, you know, participants and, and teaching them why you're doing things to that effect. Um, and this next quote, clearly in, a, in this last hour you're not going to be any educational experts, but if you just take one or two nuggets that you learned from this last hour and you incorporate them and play with it, um, you almost can't go wrong. And, and as this says, I was, I was running with uh, one of my friends and uh, we, we changed up some of our training techniques and it, and it worked really well. I said, boy, I never would have thought of that. And he just said, yeah, it was a, you know, a lucky guess. But he said, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. And uh, that's the same thing. So if we go and we do our PowerPoint lectures for 50 minutes, and we put workshops together that then have three to five speakers back to back to back to back, you know, good luck is all I can tell you. Uh, so change it up using what you have. And then just to wrap this up, if there was more time we could spend on, on some of the individual ways of uh, implementing it, but kind of to wrap it up, as best you can, try and assess those preconceived feelings, assumptions, or values around information you're presenting be that on nutrient management, be that on weeds, be that on financial planning, record keeping, whatever it's going to be. Try and assess that and then try and help the learners identify what their preconceived values are and, and address that. Speak about that openly. Uh, once you know it, once you know what learners' feelings and thoughts and assumptions and values are, you know, bring that forward and say, hey, this is what a lot of people feel. You know, this is uh, you know, how we can build on, on that. Um, Marry your information to, again, their past experiences and the utility for them. So really communicate why any of this information is useful to the people that come to your event. Create that safe learning environment. Again, you don't want to trigger fear, frustration, anger. You're going to really shoot yourself in the foot. And you're going to actually try, you know, be real purposeful on triggering positive emotions, that joy, that surprise. And then facilitate to the extent possible um, so that you're not just talking and link new information to people's prior experiences. Limit lecture time 10 to 20 minutes and, and then do an activity every 10 minutes so that the brain can process, the brain can have some downtime. And then use visuals as many said. Uh, instead of text and then speak to the visuals. Again, that six time retention if you have both visuals and oral. Provide opportunities for learners to work together and then give learners some control of what they learn. This last slide really gives you the link to uh, the website we have on effective adult learning methods for farmers. Farmers, of course, are going to be adults that we're going to be teaching most likely and so they learn like adults learn, which is why you can, you know, address how adults learn, how farmers learn in the same talk, which is pretty neat. And uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. Okay, thank you very much, Seth, mm -hmm. um, for this excellent and informative and fun presentation. Um, I just wanted to give everyone some information. Um, you can find um, the slides and you will be able to find the recording of this presentation um, on our website at the link on your screen. And um, you can also um, register for the upcoming webinars in the Excellence in Organic Extension series, as well as our many other um, upcoming webinars on organic farming topics, and view our huge archive of webinars at um, extension.org, and we've got the exact link on your screen. I have one question, um, Seth. This person would like to hear suggestions on what to do when the subject matter inherently evokes fear. For example, um, talking with growers about potential impacts of climate change 
or potentially heavy-handed government regulations coming down the pipeline? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I, I, I wish that I had um, some greater answers to you, but hmm, one of the um, one of the w things. So let me uh, let me think out loud here. So the Food Safety and Modernization Act. We've been doing a lot of education on in New Hampshire. It's a game-changing government regulation coming down the pike. It does nothing but invoke fear. We try and take that fear and, and mobilize that into action. Um, and say, okay, well, right now, you can you can comment, and comment is the the most uh, salient, positive thing that you can do, um, and and take that that fearful energy. Um, another way that you you might be able to um, help with inherently fearful things are setting people up for small successes. So make some easy problems or easy solutions and things like uh, you know. I'm thinking farm management and equations and problem solving and you know going from cash to accrual and making some real easy um, easy examples that people can succeed at first. Teaming people up um, with folks that have a higher skill level than themselves so that they can learn from others in a, in a different manner. Um, but uh, here's where I'd really be helped. What I would do now is I would open this up to the group to see who else had other um, answers and I don't know if that's possible or not. Okay, thank you. And we, we got one comment at the end, too. Um, lots of positive comments from people who enjoyed your presentation, Seth. And um, also, um, this person said um, she likes to bring in farmers to start the program um, to hear their perspectives, and it sets the tone for a meeting, hopefully a positive one. Um, we did have one more question, and that is, um, would helping farmers focus on the parts of the problem they can affect and control help? Yes, clearly. I mean, things within your control you can act on, and things without your control you can't. It doesn't. It would help. I don't see that it would fully alleviate fear, but it, it would absolutely help. Um, and just to respond also to Alice's um, comment that she just read, I think bringing farmers in helps to set the stage, and I think it helps to also address mental models. I don't know that it would help with the passive versus active learning, and that's that's a, a concept that I I hope people can gain too. Anytime I'm sitting back and I'm and I'm just ha absorbing information, I'm in a passive learning mode. It's when I go to utilize that information in some way, shape, or form, experimentation, conversation, dialoguing, solving a problem, so on and so forth. Now I'm in that active learning mode and that's going to be pretty key to have people actually be able to get the information into their working memory and into long-term memory is to get into that active learning phase. So Seth, um, thank you very much for giving this presentation. Thanks to everyone for participating today and uh, we hope to have you at our future webinars.